right. Well, I'd like you to look at John chapter 1 that Charles read to you. This is a text that um, you really can't preach. All you can do is explain it because it's like trying to explain the ocean, the Milky Way, the, uh, the Sistine Chapel. It's just too big. And so you just do the best that you can. John chapter 1, looking at verse 1 through verse 14. Possibly the most sublime words that have ever been written in language. Right here. When the Jew saw his high priest, he saw a man. This is what he saw. That's a rendition of what the high priest of Israel looked like. And maybe the Jew saw him, maybe he didn't, or just read about him, that he was in and out and you did not look upon him. But he saw a man that was more than a man. It was a glorious man. It was man and, in a sense, God coming together as, an, as a mediator. He is in a seamless, white, pure linen robe, like a coat of mail that is a, uh, uh, a, a robe without seam that cannot tear. Uh, he has a vest or an apron or an ephod that has precious gems on the front representing Israel, the treasured ones of God. They're on his heart. They're connected with chains of gold never to be moved from stones that have the names of Israel on his shoulders. So he carries Israel like a shepherd does his lamb. He carries them like a, a shepherd with a lamb next to his breast like a man would hold his wife near him which is how God saw Israel, his lamb, his bride. He has a, uh, a bright checkered tunic, possibly meaning the two of God and man intersecting down here in the Holy of Holies. He has bells down around his, uh, his robe, and they are the, the continued sound that the one whose life represents you is still alive, the tinkling of his sound. The, the beauty of that man, he's always alive. There are facsimiles of pomegranates between all of the bells. What's a pomegranate full of when you bite into it? Seeds, it's full of life. And so this high priest, he brings righteousness and he brings sweetness and life and fruitfulness and future. He has a turban that is linen. And it has a medallion that says, holy unto Yahweh, he is your representative. He is fragranced with a fragrance that no one else in Israel can wear. It's kind of, it has a cane, C-A-N-E, a cane based, and it's sweet. He's the sweet aroma of the presence of God as he represents you. And the strange thing is, there's one flaw on his robe that every year they put blood on him. Even though they take it away and wipe it off, there's a stain on him. There are marks of death on him, a violent death, that this is one that represents God before men and men before God and who takes their punishment, who offers up the shedding of a, the lamb uh, so that on the Ark of the Covenant, God can look down on his offended law and see it through one who died in their place. And so the high priest was a foreshadowing of another mediator someday. That there would be one man between one God and there's one God, man between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all. And his name is the name that no other man can have, the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord is his deity. Jesus is his physical name, human name. Christ is the melding of those two together. His offices is the God-man redeemer. He is the Lord Jesus Christ. No one can ever be named that name. And he is the most sublime mysterious, majestic entity that has ever walked this planet. Now, if you were John writing to the cosmos, the world at large, God so loved the world, how would you explain this man in 14 sentences? John does it. He takes 14 sentences and he gives you the kerygma, the essence of who this man is. And they are the most sublime words in the Bible about the most sublime person and event of the incarnation of God into humanity. And so, pray with me as we look. Father, bless this, your word, 
on this your Christmas season and delight our souls in what you did. Catch us up to you. In Christ's name, amen. Just stay with me. You can't preach this. You just explain it. In the beginning, what book does that sound like? That's Genesis. And it is. It's looking back at the creation. That in the beginning was the Word. Something was prior to the creation there with the Father. There was something else besides Him. Something else was eternal. That there is a plurality of something. There is God and then there's something else that was there. In the beginning was the Word. Now, if you were a Greek, that's an old term. It's no problem to us. That's kind of new. To the Greeks, they were the first guys to feel that truth was not arbitrarily what some deity said or oracle said or any leader said that was true. No, the Greeks said it had to be rational. Uh, logizomai, logic. You had to be something that you reasoned and spoke and thought through. Logeo, to speak. And what you thought through was a word, logos. Logos is a Greek term. And it's the idea that, that truth is something that you just don't grab and think of or come up with or has told you. It's got to be correspond to truth. And you get that, the Greek said, by going into yourself. And you think and you explain and you talk and you reason. And so the logos was something that was outside of physical reality that truly defined what existed. You could put the word logos is a synonym for truth, for reason, for rationale, for logic. It's finding what is true besides just listening to somebody because you think through it and it indeed is. It was a noble enterprise, but the problem with a finite thing that's hard to come up with an infinite thing that you call true. But the Greeks held that that was the Logos, that it was the truth outside of man. Well, John says that in the beginning was the Logos. He borrows on the Greeks. The truth was there. It already existed. And it was as old as God. And the Word was with God. That truth, reason, was not just a property of God that it was there distinct from God. The Logos is that by which you explain and which you explain yourself. Well, the Logos of God was there. The truth of who he was and what everything else was in relation to him. We could call it the answer. It was there. It was with God and it not was just not with God and distinct from him. It was it is divine and eternal and prior to the creation and distinct from the Father and with the Father was the Logos. And in verse 3, it was the Creator. All things came into being through Him and apart from Him nothing came into being that has come into being. This was, God said in Genesis, God said, let there be light. His Word brought light. God said, let there be animals. God said, let there be amphibians. God said, let there be birds. God said, let there be land. He ordained and his word brought it abound. The apostle Paul said, in him, Christ, all things were created. In the heavens and on earth, thrones or dominions. The angelic realm or, or the, uh, the human realm. All things have been created through him and for him. And he was before all things, and in him all things hold together. He was the creator and the sustainer, Jesus. The author of Hebrews says, through him God made the worlds. And so who is this eternal, distinct truth that expresses who God is in all things in reference to God and is the author of everything that exists, both material and immaterial. Who is this person? Well, 
in verse 5, in him was life. This person does not obtain life or maintain life. He is divine life. He is perfect, unflawed, eternal, self-existent, immutable, unchanging, absolute life that has always been, that is understood in light of nothing else, that everything is understood in light of it. The life of God in him was this life. And this life was the light of men. That this person possessed divine life and as a result, he is the light by which all men see. This word, this person, is the light by which all men think and judge and have conscience and know right and wrong. He is the light by which you can look at a cheese mite and understand it, or the Milky Way galaxy and understand it. You can look at evil and know that it is evil, and righteousness and know that it is good. You can hear a lie and know that it is a lie because it differs with him. That in him is life, and that life is the light of men. John said, God is light, and in him there is no darkness. He is perfect illumination. He never changes. He never lies. He is the source of everything that is good. He's the standard of all things by which you judge. Uh, men, a good verse from the Old Testament, in thy light we see light, Psalm 36. In God's light we see light. I can look and understand anything as long as I have God. I have a standard by which to judge. It was Voltaire who said, if there is no God, then we had best invent one. It was John Paul Sartre who said, all points are meaningless unless there is an infinite reference point. I was an atheist, and he said it right, that if there is no God, then nothing else makes sense. You have nothing to judge by. Is this pulpit big? We don't know. What is big? We don't know what ultimate bigness is. Is this book pretty? I don't know. What is ultimate prettiness? It's all in your opinion, unless there is life by which we see light. And so I can look at you, I can look at me, I can look at a child, I can look at my wife, I can look at society, and I do not walk in darkness, I walk in the light of life because of this person. Amen. Simple. And this light is placed in man at creation. It is called acting with knowledge. Con science. Conscience. Conscience means that I'm not ignorant. I have knowledge when I act. I'm not just dumb. I'm culpable. I'm unbelieving. I'm irreverent or I'm disobedient. But I am not in the dark. I am guilty. Because God has put light in me. This is one of the most famous paintings of all time on the Sistine Chapel by Mr. Michelangelo. Remember that? It is meant to have man and it's a mirror. Mirroring God. And yet God is with the angelic host. Man is on a rock. And man has his countenance from God, his being from God, his existence from God his light from God, his eyes from God. He is a finite representation of what God infinitely always has been. And so in God's light, man will see light. And John went so far as to saying that this person is the creator and he is the author of all light. You know what you'd call him? The light of the world. Or you can call him the way, the truth, and the life. Feel free and that no one can come to God but by him, and that whoever walks in him walks in the light of life. And so Christ is the divine life just as the Father is. He is eternal just as the Father is. He is creator just as the Father is. He is perfect just as the Father is. The term triunity has not been invented, but it is being extrapolated right here. In verse 
5. This has been real good so far. Have y'all enjoyed this? Well, it's going to take an ugly turn. It says the light shines in the darkness. The darkness is this world under the prince of the power of the air. Shines, it's in the present tense. His incarnation, his preaching, the church, his word, the light shines in the dark. And sadly enough, the darkness did not, Catalambano, it did not seize down, get its arms around, overtake it. Sometimes it means to grasp it. It didn't comprehend it. You go out today and if you see somebody caroling, snapping their fingers during Johnny Mathis, you say to him, can I tell you what you're snapping your fingers about? The infinite God took his eternal son and he incarnated himself into mankind to become one of us. And the life that you can't live, he lived. The life that you should die for, he died for. And he became our perfect God and God's perfect man, our mediator forever, whereby we can come to him with empty hands and be found righteous in his sight and live forever. Merry Christmas. Now, Generally, what will somebody tell you to do? Shut up and move on. Because they don't understand it. And furthermore, that statement has a moral barb to it. You're saying I'm not smart enough to figure out God? I know that's hard to believe. But yes. You're saying I'm not holy enough to achieve God's pleasure? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I'm not good enough. You're saying I need a Jesus? I just can't come to God alone? That's what I'm saying. You get out of here. You get your Bible out of here. You get your Christian pals out of here. And don't you come back. Because you're insulting, judging me that way. And that has been the story of history since the day the, the, the in slammed on him and the hammer rained down on that nail. That has been the story. Is that the light shone and the darkness did not get its arms around it. Which person did he do wrong? What person did he insult? Where did he steal? What evil did he have to sneak around to do? What child did he hurt? What old person did he hurt? What blind guy did he do wrong? And yet the darkness did not comprehend him. Well, in verse 6, even though he was the object of, of the Old Testament revelation. There came a man sent from God whose name was John. He came for a witness to bear witness about the light. The Old Testament ends in Malachi saying that a forerunner will come. The last word of the Old Testament is that there will be a prophet to the New Testament, a John the Baptist, dressed in all of the regalia of Elijah. The prophetic realm will rise again and God will speak. And he will say, behold, the Lamb of God. For our president to become president, he must be sworn in by somebody. It's the Supreme Court judge, the head of the Supreme Court. He's the guy that makes you put your hand on the Bible and swear to defend, protect, to uphold the Constitution of the United States. You can't get sworn in in El Paso. I'm sorry. A uh, guy can't do it in Austin. guy can't do it in L.A. It's got to be the head of our court of law. He's got to say, we put ourselves in the hands of this guy. And nobody else can do it. To be the Messiah, the Old Testament has to put its hand on you. And that's what it does. John, or Philip said, we have found him of whom Moses and the law and the prophets spoke, Jesus of Nazareth. He's come. And beginning with Moses and the prophets, he spoke to them the things concerning him in all of the law. The angel said, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. He's the essence of the Bible. As many as are the promises of God in him, they are yes. And his name shall be called the word of God. Do not think I came to abolish the law. Not one jot or tittle will pass away until all is fulfilled. Foolish men, so slow to understand all that was spoken by the law and the prophets. And so, God sent a man who said, he's here. Come thou long expected Jesus, he's here. He came to testify about the light that all would believe. 
everybody had offered to them this enlightenment in the dark. This new life was offered them. And he pointed. And John is careful to say in verse 8, he was not the light. No man can call himself final truth. Amen. I don't care if it's Chairman Mao, John Lennon. I don't care if it's even Elvis. It's not final truth. Uh, Lucifer can't be final truth. He's a created thing. We understand Lucifer in light of God, not God in light of Lucifer. Nature cannot be final truth. John was a lamp shining in the darkness. He contained the light, but he was not the light. No human can say they are final truth. And whenever you set aside this God that is self-evident and makes himself known, and you turn from the infinite to a finite, either nature, gods, or man, or human reason, you have begun the implosion of the Death Star. In time, your civilization is going to turn to horror when you do that. And so he is not the light. And verse 8, but he testified about the light. Man cannot claim that he is truth. What man can do, now listen to me, is he can testify. It's the word martus. It means witness. You can point to him and say there is the truth. You saying you know the truth? I'm saying I ain't the truth, but I'm saying he is. And so John said, that's him. And the Spirit of God descended and God spoke and said, this is my son whom I'm well pleased. And John said, I'm not worthy to unlatch his sandal. And so the Old Testament, the Father and the Spirit came together on the Son. And in verse 9, there was the true light wasn't John. It's the true light. When it says the true light, it means that this person doesn't refer to anybody else. He doesn't quote anybody else. If he says it, it's a done deal. If he speaks it into creation, it's there. If he speaks it out of creation, it's gone. But if he says it exists, it's this. And if he says it's true, it's true. He is the true light. Now, watch this, because if you got socks, get ready to take them off, because I'm about to rot them right off your feet. You ever had something just rot your socks right off? That's a rare word. In verse 9, the true light, which, what's the verb? Coming or sent. True light is not within nature. It is sent from the outside. It comes into nature. Man will not find it. In Job 28, he, go, he says, you know, you can go into the earth and spelunk, and you can find any ore that is down in the earth. Man can find it. But you're not going to find wisdom unless God speaks to you. You better have a Biblos, a Bible. You better have an incarnation. You better have a, a cradle. You better have a manger. Or you're not going to have truth unless God speaks. And the true light, and it's coming into the world. There is your ultimate philosophic statement. If you're a philosopher and you're looking for truth and you just read that, you just threw up your hands. There is life. It comes from God. And that God's life is light by which we understand all things. And he came into the world. You're telling me that God once walked among us. Yes. It was Plato who said that as you go through life, you must hold to the best opinions of men, like a bark in a storm, unless you have a more final word of God. And so it's come. It has come into the world. And in verse 9, it enlightens every man. Every man can have this person lower his candle and give him light. He enlightens every man. You know why it's the ultimate philosophic event? It goes like this. As soon as Jesus was born, a choir busted out of angels. And they said this. Glory to God in the very highest. And where is there peace among men? And on Peace among men. 
Glory to God in heaven in the highest and on earth peace. God is glorified. Man is at peace. They've been brought together because God has become a man. And you'll find a sign. You'll find a baby lying in a garage. That's the sign. You'll not find any other baby in a manger. This baby. That's the sign. He has gone to the bottom for you. In verse 9, he enlightens every man. That's why there is peace. He's the light of the world. Remember John 9, that blind man came to Christ? And Christ spit, because to a Jew, your spit was your essence. When you talk about a twin, it's the guy spit an image. You have a son that you're spit an image. It means your spit and your image. Jesus spit. <laughs> and then he takes clay and he makes clay. Where else in the Bible did a deity make clay? In the creation of Adam. Well, this is a new creation. We hadn't got a creature here out of nothing. We got a creature that is flawed and he's blind and he can't see and he can't live. So Jesus spits. The guy knew what he was doing. And then he takes clay. We're going to make a new man. And I'm going to put him on your eyes. And then he said, go wash in the pool called Siloam. You know what that means in Hebrew? John even puts it in John chapter uh, uh, 9. He says, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. You go wash in the pool of the one who sent. And he went and washed and he came back soon. That's how you get light. You don't go to college. No offense. But that's how you get light. Is you come to the one sent from God and you let him take his life and make you a new creation, and you come back seeing. He enlightens every man. Isaiah 35, 5. The eyes of the blind shall be opened. John the Baptist, are you the one coming and we should look for somebody else? Just go tell him this. The blind see. Just tell him that. I'm the one that is going to recreate man back into the image of God. And things are going to make sense. And the guy will now understand God and truth and man. He's still going to have flesh, but we're going to overpower it by a new nature. We're going to have men made new. And I'm going to lead them right to the very throne of glory. I'm going to give them light. In verse 10. This is pretty good so far. It's about to get real ugly. In verse 10, he was in the world and the world was made through him. This person came to the world and it was a world that he made. You're telling me that God walked among men. Yes. That's unbelievable. God walked among men. The way you find God is you don't smoke peyote and have an experience and get caught up in heaven. You don't do mescaline and get caught up in heaven. I'm sorry, Timothy Leary, you don't do LSD and get caught up in heaven. You don't have a magical mystery tour. Is anybody with me on here? You don't think that you're the Eggman or the walrus. Are you with me now? You're old. You're old. Man is always trying to reach God. He was in the world and the world was made by him. He came. Amen? He came. And it wasn't in response to a prayer request. He showed up by grace. He came. The greatest of all events, Hologo Sarks Egenetto, the word became flesh. You can't go beyond that in glory. That there is a God, yes. A personal God, yes. A Trinitarian God, yes. And he became a man, one of us to show us who he was. That is all I need to know. If I die right now, I'm okay. Because I see all things. He was in the world and the world was made through him, but in verse 10, the world did not know him. It doesn't just mean recognize him. He stuck out his hand and we slapped it. 
How do you do, sir? I'd like to get to know you. <laughs> Slap the hand out of there. He offered his name and we turned our backs because he rubbed the fur the wrong way. He talked too much about, well, like he said, I speak of the world's deeds that they are evil. I don't mind being mystic. I don't mind being hokey and spooky and I don't mind, I'll do astral projection and I'm a rama 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 lama ding dong. I'll do whatever you want me to do. All right. But just don't call me a sinner. Amen. Don't be talking that repent word. Don't be talking that sin word. I'll do anything you want me to do. I'll do reincarnation. But just don't talk sin. Don't insinuate I need an authority outside of me to define who I am, who you are. And you better not say I need somebody to go get killed for my sake and infer that about God and about me because that makes me real mad. And so the world did not know him. He preached the wrong sermon. He was in the world. The world was made through him. The world didn't know him. And John now gets very specific. He came to his own. That word own in the Greek is in neuter. His own things. This world was his. It was his things. When he caught that miraculous draft of fishes, those were his fishes. How do you make a bunch of fish jump into a net by mental telepathy? How do you make one fish jump by mental telepathy? Go home and try it. He made a whole bunch of fish jump right into the net. Right there. Fish. How do you make one fish swallow a coin and bite a hook? I don't believe in fishing anyway. I don't think it's possible. I've seen guys fish. I've heard of guys fishing. I've seen guys from Louisiana named Jimmy at 7 o'clock in the morning fish on TV. But there is no such thing as fish. It doesn't exist. I've never seen one caught. He threw it out there in a fish pit. Just the fish he wanted. How did that little donkey carry him? He made it. How did that light shine in the heavens? He made it. How did the winds and the waves stop? Because he made it. Where'd they get the metal to make a nail? He made it. Where'd they get the wood to make a cross? It was his tree. They said when Christ turned the water into wine, the water saw its creator and blushed. (laughs) And so he came to his domain. This was his. He owned it. And those who were his own, it is speaking here of the nation that was his, Israel. He came to the Jew first because they were telegraphed that he's coming. He came to his own. And those who were his own did not receive him. They slammed the door at the inn. They said he did his miracles by the devil. They slammed the door on the synagogue. They slammed the temple, and then they slammed it on his life. And then he rose from the dead, and they lied and said that his disciples took it. And to this day, they will not speak his name. He came to his own things, and those who were his own did not, simply did not know him. They did not receive him. Get your hand out of here. I had a kid that I discipled that was a gold medal winner in the Olympics. He was signing autographs. He signed his name, Brandon. John 112 handed it to a kid. Kid came back. Bless his heart. He was a Jewish kid. He said, my mother says you've got to cross that out. To as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become sons of God. Cross it out. I deny him. Y'all pretty sad yet? This is unbelievable. You're telling me that the eternal second person of the Godhead, the life of God, the light of truth, became a man and came to us and we executed him. Yeah. In Texas, you can't put a guy on a cross. It's illegal in America because it's cruel and unusual. We found our congregations on an instrument of slow death and execution. And that's what we did to him. 
Now, if you're here from Mars, you're probably saying, wait a minute. <laughs> you're saying to me, let me get this straight, that everything that exists is not eternal, but it came from the fiat command of a deity. Yes. And that deity is plurality or trinity. Personable. Yes. And one of the members acted out the creation. Yes. And is the source of life. Yes. And light. Yes. Now let me make sure. And you're saying he came among his own creation. Not as a titan, but he came as one of us, a baby. Yeah. And grew up perfect. Yeah. And we didn't know him and we didn't receive him. That's what I'm saying. Did I hear you say that we killed him? Yeah. Did I hear you say we killed him slow and laughed at him? And there was no other hope outside of him. No. Are you humans the stupidest human beings that have ever lived? <laughs> or just the foulest? No one can be this. No one can be that self-destructive. Y'all are mad. But you build things that go to the moon. You must not be mad. There must be an entity outside of you, less than God, that imitates God, that sucks you in. That's all I can figure out. The Bible didn't teach a devil. You would have to assume one. Well, in verse 12, it takes a turn upward Verse 12, chapter 12, or verse 12, first word, what is it? But, hallelujah. There's always a however with God. You meant it for evil, God meant it for good. Out of this bloody mess, God is going to do something. He saved Israel through the rejection of Joseph. He saved Israel through the rejection of Moses. And he's going to save these people. And he's going to save men through the rejection of this person. But as many as did receive him. Who is the as many? He came to the world. He came to his own. They didn't want him. Who are the singular as many who come to him and receive life? What age are we speaking of here? Starts with a ch. Sounds like urch. It's that age after proceeding the Israelite rejection. As many, anybody, anywhere, any kid, any old person, any young, any old, any poor, any rich, any race, any person you are, he will never turn you away. If you will receive him, that means that you just don't intellectually recognize him, that you hear who he is, this is the Lord, Jesus Christ, who is wounded for you, your mediator. And you say, well, excuse me. Sir, I bow my knee and I kiss your feet. And I bless your soul for loving me. And I would please ask you to take my guilt away. And I take you into my house as Zacchaeus did. You come in and you sit, for you must come to my house. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come into him and I will eat with him. And he'll eat with me together. We'll give and take. I'll be your friend. Amazing. To as many as received him, every single one he will not turn away. He will give them the right. It's the Greek word that means authority. If I come into my house, I better not see an unknown person eating in my refrigerator because they don't have the power to do that. It doesn't mean the ability to open a refrigerator. They don't have the legal right to go marching into my house. You better knock or you better ring. If I go into my house, will I see my sons eating at my refrigerator? Will there be anything left? <laughs> they will clean it out. I'll assure you, like a company of Marines has been through there. Why? They have the power. It doesn't mean they have the power to open a refrigerator. They have the authority as my son. To whoever received him, your name is in the book of life. God knows you by first name, and you are a son. 
Come unto me all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You're mine. Just to those who believe in his name, that he is who he said he is, the divine redeemer, I believe that and I accept it. In verse 13, and not only do you have a new right, you have a new nature. They are born, they start all over. Not of blood, talking about human birth, not of the will of the flesh, talking about ethnic, probably, what your flesh is. Are you a Christian? Well, I've been Scottish Reformed all my life. That doesn't matter. I've been part of the Church of England. I've been part of the Church of Ireland. I've been a Roman Catholic. I don't care what your flesh is, what your body does. No, it's not ethnic. It is not physical. You're not born a Christian. You're born a sinner. You may be born an Irish sinner or a Jewish sinner, but your blood and your flesh do not determine your soul. And it's not a will of man. You will do nothing to alter your estate. You will not clean up your life. You will not improve your life. You will not get yourself spick and span. The more you clean, the dirtier you'll become. The more that you refuse Christ and try on your own to make yourself presentable, the more grotesque you become in God's sight. With every scrub and every rub, you become more and more detestable. Because every one is a recognition. I do not take him. I take me. And he gets more and more incensed at your filthy rags. And so to as many as received him, he gave the right to become children of God, to believe in his name. They are born. Not of being in a hospital, not of being in an ethnic group, not of being in a, in a moral detergent. But they are born of God. God will draw them. God will convert them. And God will change them. In verse 14, the reason that men can become sons of God is that in 14, a son of God became a son of man. It was C.S. Lewis who said, the son of God became a son of men, that son of men might become sons of God. The word Christ became, incidentally, that's the word egeneto. It's the root word for Genesis. It's like a new beginning. The word became flesh. He didn't just appear. He became one of us. He wasn't Clark Kent. Was Clark Kent human? No, he just looked human. He had glasses. He just dated the stupidest brunette that ever lived. That's a fact. Hey, you look a lot like Superman. Huh? Why? No, I'm a reporter. My bad. <laughs> Clark Kent never knew what being a human was. He was a fake. Christ was not Clark Kent. You dig? He was not Clark Kent. He got hungry and thirsty and he hurt and he cried because we do. And all the time there was deity right here and all he had to do was grab it and he wouldn't do it became like us the word became flesh the word there dwelt s-k-e-n-o-o -S -E and it means the tabernacle if I understand correctly the root word we get our word skin tabernacle were skins God was in a skin the tabernacle was a temporary place where the glory of God dwelled well, the word became flesh and he tabernacled. The glory of God was among us and we, John uses the plural, first person pronoun, we, we apostles, not you guys, we saw his glory. I watched him speak to the winds and the waves. I was on the Mount of Transfiguration. I saw him glow, glow, glow so bright he scared us to death. I watched this man walk on water. I watched this man speak to demons. I watched him speak to handicaps. I watched him touch lepers, and it was gone, and he took it to himself. I watched this man die. I watched them poke his side, and the blood and the water run out. I watched him put him in a, in a tomb and roll a stone in front of it. And I'm telling you, I saw the man. I, put, I saw the holes in his sides, and he's alive. I watched him go up into glory until he went out of sight. No, he's like Moses. 
said, God, I want to see your glory. John said, we saw him. The Greek means, I'm not a whoofing you. I'm not kidding you. I don't lie about things like this. I have seen God among us. And it's the glory as of the only from the Father. The word begotten in there in Greek is the word M-O-N-O-G-E-N-E-S, monogenes, and it means one of a kind. He is the one of a kind. He is not the Son of God by creation like an angel. He's not the Son of God by selection like Israel. He's not the Son of God by rebirth like a Christian. He's not the Son of God like a politician by responsibility called the Son of God. He is the Son of God because He's one of a kind. He's the same nature as the Father. He's God's begotten. And John said, He is full of grace and truth. He's not just a light show. He was full of grace. He was kind to little kids, to women, to old guys, to sick guys, to poor guys, to dying guys, to hurting guys. I saw grace and I saw truth. I saw holiness. You could put him in the worst of situations and you could not get a rise. You could put him in the fiercest of situations and you saw nothing but trust. I have seen God among us. And he is full of grace and truth. Stay with me. A fellow named Frederick Church was called the greatest American painter a landscape artist from the 1860s. His greatest work, Frederick Church did, was called The Icebergs. And it was unveiled in 1861, and it was called by the New York Tribune when he did it, the greatest, most splendid work of art yet produced in this country. He was an American-English sensation. Church, Remington, Winslow Homer, these guys, they were your American original sensations of a new country. His painting, The Icebergs, was brought, bought by a member of Congress uh, in Parliament, uh, of English Parliament, Sir Edward Watkin in 1863. And Watkin kept this painting at his own country residence, so no one ever saw it. Didn't put it in a museum, just put it in his country home. And it was a country home called Rose Hill, and it disappeared from common viewing. Watkin died in 1901, so for 40 generations, no one ever saw this painting. It went out, out of sight, out of mind. Rose Hill ultimately became a boys' school, and then it became a dilapidated boys' school. And the painting was forgotten, and the icebergs was lost to America and to the world uh, after almost 100 years. Until 1979, there was a man who had been doing work, I think it was a bookkeeper, for Rose Hill Boys' School. And they were, begin they were doing some work on it. And he kept noticing when he would work on this school, he would see this picture. He wasn't an art lover, this man, buddy, but he, he would look at this picture. And he would say, the picture was six by nine, six foot by nine feet. It was huge. And it was, it was overpowering. The light and it was a pathetic, passionate picture. You see the masthead down at the bottom. It recorded the uh, 18, uh, I think it was 1849, 47, whenever the Franklin Expedition was searching for the Northwest Passage and was destroyed and they died. And it was sad to all Englishmen. He depicted it. And it shows that the man just kept looking at this skill and this use of light and this majesty. And it was in this old boys' school, stuck in this place, out of the way place. And he said, what is that thing doing there? And he just, it would draw his eyes to it and he couldn't take his eyes off it. And it shows the awful might of nature as you see this broken mast. And yet it, you can't see it in the picture. But once the picture was made, the last thing he did was go to the rock on the lower left and Frederick Church painted as though it were inscribed and chipped into the rock, F.E. Church, 1861. Kind of like Kilroy was here. Just to let everybody know, man has staked his claim and he's coming back. And so he put it in there. Well, this worker looked at it and finally he went and found a buddy who knew his art. And he said, I just want you to come look at this. 
I've never seen anything like it. And he described it, and the worker said, our guy said, no. And he went and looked at it, and elation hit because icebergs had been discovered. And the art world was a gas. Early 1980s, it was sold for the largest price ever sold at the time, $2.5 million to Lamar Hunt. It is now in the Dallas Art Museum. I've seen it, and it's still overwhelming. And there's a great point to this, that it is possible for the most majestic and beautiful things to lay overlooked and hidden and forgotten because of its incredible superiority amidst the commonness of its surroundings. That we don't recognize it. It's too above us. And all who walk about it unknowing, darkened, and unaffected simply because of the superlativeness of his beauty. Where did they find the icebergs? Right where it said it would be once they caught up to it. Poor little Jesus boy. We didn't know who he was. Pray with me. Our Father, we are so thankful for your dear son. A son that we don't understand, a son that was above us, a son that was beyond us, a son that was too brilliant, too beautiful, too lovely, too good, too kind, too gentle, that transcended everything that is the source of all that is true. And science tells us difference, and philosophy tells us different, and psychology tells us different, and politics tells us different, and the arts tell us different, simply because they're on shaky ground. And we will not trust them because what they are, they will not be in days to come. But in him, we have a rock. And if I die tomorrow, that's okay, because I know who you are, and I know who I am.